All right, ownership of the San Antonio Spurs continues to change. Aramark says they have reached a deal to sell half of the ownership stake in the team for $100 million. So all of this according to a report from Sportico. Aramark CEO John Zilm were reportedly in a call with a Wall Street analyst yesterday saying they sold approximately half of their interest because there was a buyer who was working with the team to establish an ownership position and they have no intention of keeping the other part of their ownership. Remember, back in 2021, Sixth Street bought 20% of the Spurs and Michael Dell 10% at a reported $1.8 billion valuation. And speaking of the NBA, in the Eastern Conference semifinals, the Sixers winning big at the Celtics in Boston, 115-103, to taking a 3-2 series lead. To have my teammates be there with me through thick and thin, understanding, you know, what it is. And it's a great feeling, honestly. I'm really going to cherish this day and, um, and soak it all in. I mean, you know the name, you know the face. Look at that shot. Lonnie Walker scoring all 15 of his points in the fourth quarter two nights ago, helping the Lakers beat the Warriors 104-101. The Lakers now have a 3-1 series lead against the Warriors, the reigning champs in the Western Conference semifinals. All right, going to UIW, Shane Hireman introduced as the new head men's basketball coach. And during his presser, he said he wants players with grit and nastiness. Now, coach is 34 years old, and one of the first things he did was hire former Spurs guard Jaron Jackson as one of his assistant coaches. Hireman coached Jaron Jackson Jr. in high school, now of the Memphis Grizzlies, and Jackson Sr. was an assistant on that staff. They are reunited at Incarnate Word. As a, so many people that have come through the Spurs and it's impacting the world in, in basketball from a coaching perspective and it's doing great things and uh, and to just to be a part of that myself it's, it's a it's a blessing so and hopefully I can bring a little Spurs way here to Tim Corner work and to coach Shane who who knows my my past and, and, and recognizes it and he he had a little taste of it with my son. I remember Jackson winning the NBA title with the Spurs back in 1999. And of course, if you remember the series, he scored 11 points in the title clinching fifth game against the Knicks. All right, TCU head coach Sonny Dykes driving from Fort Worth all the way to San Antonio this morning all in an effort to speak at the San Antonio Quarterback Club. He said it's great to be here. He enjoyed the drive. Then eh, gave us a chance to ask him about UTSA head coach Jeff Trailer, who's having incredible success with the Roadrunners. Jeff's done a tremendous job at UTSA. I mean, I got to know Jeff um, and, and know him well. Uh, you know, he was a really successful high school coach, won a lot of games. You know, when he became assistant at the University of Texas, he's one of those guys that you watched and you just knew he was going to be successful. And, you know, I'm not surprised with the success they've had. Uh, I think the city of San Antonio has done a tremendous job of, of jumping in and, and uh, investing in the program, and I hope they continue to do that because if they do, they're, they're going to win a lot of football games around here. And, of course, we can celebrate head coach Trailer. It was his birthday this week, UTSA football, as you see on your screen. Tweeting happy birthday to the leader and uh, hoping you're having a good one, Coach. And speaking of UTSA, UTSA senior Cameron Carrion didn't let a rainy day in a 53-minute weather delay at TPC San Antonio Oaks course. Slower down, entering the second round of the NCAA San Antonio Regional at one under par. Cameron fired a 5-under 67 to sit at 6-under for the day with a four-shot lead heading to the final round. Cam teeing off from number one, 855 in the morning. Oh, I can swing like that. I cannot. I, I can I, swing like that, but I don't make contact. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's always amazing to see these athletes on the course and then make it look so easy. Yeah. And then when you go out there, you're like, why, do you, why can't I? <laughs> I can fully commit to the swing. It's just the connection. Yeah. That's a I'm working on it. Important part. In the summer, the San Antonio Food Bank makes a push for more donations. How rising food prices affect the need in our community and more answers about it in a live interview in our next half hour. And we're taking a live look at SA Live set, Historic Ooh, Market a lot Square. Of people. Got a group of fifth graders, GT fifth graders from Harlandale ISD with them today. Stay tuned. SA Live starts right after the news at noon. The San Antonio Food Bank is in a great job. It helps thousands of families from in and around our community, not just every month or every year, but every week. 
and in the summer months, the need seemingly only grows. That's right. There are so many ways to step up, help out, and to talk about that need and what you can do. Michael Guetta with the Food Bank joining us live. Good afternoon, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Max. Good afternoon. All right. So, Michael, give us some perspective. What does the current need look like for the Food Bank? You know, I know we've been a little quiet, um, but during this time of January, February, March, um, one big thing happened, and that was a rollback of some pandemic benefits that people got as a part of their food stamps. You know, but what we're hearing from families is it's really the challenge of working, but not having enough money or working and getting less hours. Those are the top two reasons we're seeing more people. And just to put a number around that need, um, February to March, we saw 38% more people asking for food. In sheer numbers, Max, that's uh, went from about 175,000 unique individuals in a week to 200 and, uh, 234,000. Okay, so that's a big jump, just February to March. And, I, you know, as I said, there's some particular reasons around um, just, you know, not making it to the end of the month and not getting enough hours that are driving some of that need. Michael, the, the summertime is also uh, kind of a, a tough time for families. Um, it, we know it's going to come every year, but we also know the food bank usually has to cover that gap of the food that families generally get at their school districts and what they have at home uh, in the refrigerator. Um, how can that, how can that, how can we help, I guess, in that particular time of the year? Well, you, you know, well, you described it. It's about 20 million meals um, that kids who are uh, in low-income families that they'll miss in the summer when they're missing that breakfast or lunch in a free reduced way at school during the school year. It's a big gap of 20 million meals. So we're going to rely on our community to join us in raising the food and the funds and, and volunteering, frankly, uh, to close that gap. Um, around the corner, you know, our letter carriers do something to honor mothers every Mother's Day weekend with a big stamp out hunger food drive coming up this Saturday. Um, in fact, you know, a lot of people might have gotten a, a blue bag of sorts in their mailbox that the letter carriers uh, put out. And thanks to CPS Energy for the help of that. But this stamp out hunger is just one way. It's immediate way now, but there are lots of ways between now and really the end of August that we need our community to help us with food, with funds and with volunteerism. Now, I don't want to be a damper, but this morning the consumer price index was released and per the CPI, food prices are up more than 7%. So you know, are you guys feeling that effect? I know you said you saw an increase to 240,000 or 234,000 unique individuals a week. But when that CPI number increases, food gets more expensive. How does that affect not only how much food you guys can give out, but how many people line up and how much food you guys can afford? Yeah, it's, a, it's an unfortunate bind right now. You know, need trending up, uh, especially as we get towards summer, but already trending up with the summer not even here yet. Uh, and food donations are trending down. Uh, we are seeing, especially the non-perishable food items, Max, you know, those staples like peanut butter and jelly that kids, you know, might want in the summer, mac and cheeses, rice and beans, the shelf-stable items that really go a long way for families on a budget. Um, that's what we rarely see. That's what's so great about a food drive like this Stamp Out Hunger one this Saturday. It's our largest one-day food drive in the year. Um, but again, you know, any church or business organization, um, I, we see kids taking up these food drives for the summer, starting them and then, and then finishing them, you know, in June or July. Lots of ways that people can lean in to do it besides stamp out hunger. But that's a great one, too. Talking about the price of food um, affecting everyone, it, it makes you have more customers. Um, but it also encourages people to donate, make a cash donation of some sort to the food bank. Because from what I understand, you guys have better buying power than I could offer at the grocery store, not to diss our grocery stores or anything, but you guys have some very deep discounts you can take advantage of. Well, it, it, thank you. And so often it is that um, the product, would, you know, the, the produce or the non-perishable items might be donated, and we're just having to pay for the logistics, for the transportation, storing, and distribution. And what that allows us to do is, um, like that grocery cart there, we can take $1 and provide 10 pounds of food. And generally we say that 10 pounds of food which equal $10, which provides 100 pounds of food, that 100 pounds is generally what you might put when you fill up a grocery cart. So our $10 goes a long way, and you can always make a secure donation at our website at safefoodbank.org. So if you don't want to do the food driver, or if you aren't going to be around to help with Stamp Out Hunger this Saturday, making that online donation is certainly one of the most efficient ways to do it. 
I also think, um, just as, as a mother, filling up that bag inside the house in front of your kids and putting it out for the letter carriers is actually a really good idea um, to, to show kids this is what you do because it, it's yeah. very visual for them to take it out of the pantry, put it in the bag and stick it on the curb. I think it's the best, you know, teaching our kids uh, those little um you know, lessons and doing that together, um, seeing the letter carrier pick it up and thanking the kids um, if they're grabbing that and taking that away. I mean, there's joy, I know, on the letter carrier side when they see that. Um, but it's the way that we build our community up. Uh, we're not going to solve hunger by a canned good. It's really going to creating um, families and communities of conscience and people who have compassion. And this is it's a great way to do that. So thanks for calling that out. I think it's perfect. All right, Michael Guetta with the Food Bank. Thank you so much. Hopefully we can get someone out there this Saturday morning to talk to you guys about Stampin' Out Hunger. Thank you, Michael. Good right. luck. Thank you all. Thank you. Meantime, on Saturday as well, a good day to take a look at your pantry and gather up some things for the Food Bank because going outside may not be too much fun. It uh, potentially could be very wet here around the area. Uh, a good rainfall chance over the weekend. And Saturday's a day where particularly concerned about because there is a threat for some pretty heavy rain. Let's look across the country and I'll, I'll show you that uh, Texas is still pretty warm comparatively speaking. We're at 75 here in San Antonio, 80 out in El Paso, but not as hot as it is in Florida. 90 right now in Orlando at 90 in Miami and you can bet it's steamy there too. The cool weather's up across the Pacific Northwest where we're in the mid 50s, Boise, Portland, Seattle. They are going to get some more weather though coming up in, the, in their forecast. And for us, a lot of the cooler weather you see here from Waco down to San Antonio is because uh, we have cloud cover. But once those clouds go away, we should see uh, temperatures warm up a little bit more. And those clouds are trying to scatter out. They're having a hard time so far, but mostly cloudy here around San Antonio right now. Again, 75, 80 in Pleasanton, 85 where there's more sun out in Del Rio, and 85 down there in Cotula where there's also more sun. Uh, just about everyone's in the 70s now with see, uh, and seeing a few peaks of sun. Our forecast today calls for just a 20% chance rain will make it up to 85 for high. 20% uh, chance this evening to temperatures in the low 80s and we dip down in the 70s tonight. Pretty much status quo the next couple days. But it all changes this weekend and we're going to talk more about how much rainfall we could see by Saturday into Sunday. That's coming up. All right, thank you, Justin. Republican Congressman George Santos now facing criminal charges. Santos now in custody after surrendering to federal authorities on Long Island. ABC's Rena Roy with a look at all the charges. Embattled Republican Congressman George Santos facing a judge today, just hours after federal prosecutors announced criminal charges. Santos charged with wire fraud, money laundering, theft of public funds, and making false statements. In the 13-count indictment, prosecutors allege he used political contributions to line his pockets, unlawfully applied for pandemic-era unemployment benefits, and lied to the House of Representatives. Santos expected to appear in court later today. Sources tell ABC News he's expected to plead not guilty. Congressman, did you misuse campaign finances? He's cleared the way and blocked the entrance. He's cleared the way and blocked the media. Santos hasn't said how he was able to donate more than half a million dollars to his campaign after earning just $55,000 two years earlier. He's also facing allegations that he illegally used campaign funds to pay for personal expenses like rent. Santos has denied any criminal wrongdoing. Are you worried about being prosecuted? I have, I have no clue. I don't know what it's about. You have no idea what it's about? Nope. There have been growing calls for Santos to step down. He's been accused of lying about everything from his resume to his family history. Will you step down? I will not. The congressman said he worked for Goldman Sachs and Citigroup, graduated from college, and that his grandparents survived the Holocaust and his mother was in the 9-11 attacks. All of that is untrue. Santos speaking with Piers Morgan on Talk TV. I've been a terrible liar. It wasn't about tricking the people. This was about getting accepted by the party here local. If Santos is convicted of a crime, he could continue to serve in Congress, though he'd likely face growing pressure to resign. He would have to be removed by two-thirds majority vote in the House. If convicted, Santos faces 20 years in prison, though it's unclear if he'll actually end up serving that much time. Rena Roy, ABC News, Central Islip, New York. Author E. Jean Carroll calling her civil court victory over former President Donald Trump. 
his lawyers and uh, his lawyers, by the way, are vowing to fight that decision. In less than three hours, a federal New York jury of six men and three women found Trump liable for sexually abusing Carol in a department store dressing room. Back in the 1990s, they say that the jury also unanimously found Trump defamed Carol when he called her uh, a liar. The verdict is also ordering Trump to pay $5 million in damages. Trump is calling the verdict a disgrace. His attorney, again, promising an appeal. Well, he's firm in his belief, as many people are, that he cannot get a fair trial in New York City. Tonight, Trump is slated to take questions from New Hampshire voters at a town hall that is hosted by CNN. New Hampshire, home to one of the first primary contests in the nation in 2024. Trump remains the Republican frontrunner in most polls. For the first time, the FDA considering allowing women to get birth control pills in the U.S. without a prescription. The agency wrapping up a two-day meeting of independent advisors to help decide what to do next. The FDA advisors will sift through the scientific evidence and make a recommendation to the agency. It's expected to make a final decision by the end of summer. Medical associations such as the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists for years have supported over-the-counter access to birth control without any age restrictions. However, some experts do have concerns. The DEA is extending some flexibilities that allow people to get controlled medications via telehealth. This comes after a public health emergency declaration following the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic was set to expire on May 11th. So the DEA will now allow it to stay in place through November 11th. That means that you can still get telemedicine, their medicines delivered after a telemedicine relationship that began after November 11th. It'll be subject to, subject to pre-pandemic rules, that is, unless a new rule saying otherwise is set. Control substances include medications like those prescribed for attention deficit disorder, uh, attention hyperactivity disorder, anxiety, opioid addiction, and sleep or pain disorders. All right, let's take a live look out of the Alamo City. 76 degrees out there. Justin, have we got enough rain in the last 48 hours? Uh, well, we got some good soaking rains yesterday. It was really nice, in fact, and we've got some more chances coming up. Before we talk about the forecast, so I want to give you a bit of a traffic alert oh. here. I believe what we're looking at here is 35 southbound, right before you get on to 410. It looks like they've got it completely shut down here and on our traffic map. It does show a big slowdown here. I-35 is stacking back now quite a ways. So just a heads up there. Again, 35, 410, a traffic uh, incident there. We'll keep you posted. More on the forecast coming up. Welcome back. Let's go outside for you once again. We've got cloudy skies still here in San Antonio. We're waiting on these clouds to break up. So far has not happened. We're at 75. Dew point is at 68, so it is extremely humid with north northeasterly winds at about 7 miles per hour. Here's a look at the satellite picture. And we are starting to see the clouds break apart in many locations, just not over Bear County. So if you're in Hondo, you're starting to see a little bit of sun. Same in Uvalde, Del Rio, uh, New Braunfels. The sun is trying to pop out. And I do think that happens here in San Antonio, but we may have to give it another hour or so. 80 in Pleasanton, where we've seen more sun, mid 80s in places like Creosote Springs and Catula. And we're in the mid 70s here around town right now on our way to 80s this afternoon. That's the idea as these clouds thin out some. Uh, right now we're forecasting right around 84, 85 uh, later today here in town with some warmer numbers down to the south and west. And then if you're in the hill country, Pretty much uh, low 80s, I think, is what you can expect later today. Here's the current situation. We've got a spinning low up here around Waco. That's bringing some rain up and down I-35 north of us. But between Waco and Dallas, you'll run into some rain. And then we've had some thunderstorms around the Houston area, a place that got hit pretty hard yesterday. They're getting more rain. But this all stays away from us. We're on the back side of this circulation. Uh, so it's a pretty much dry here, and uh, we're not really looking for much rain today or tomorrow as the slow moves away. A uh, fairly dry forecast. We will watch for some storms that try to make it into our western counties tomorrow, uh, but I don't think uh, really much comes from that. It's not until Friday that we start to see rain really make a big return, and it's over the weekend where we've got some concerns for heavy rain and the, the potential for some flash flooding. Here's why. We've got a low up to the north. This helps to push... Uh, front south, so we'll have a frontal battery in place. We've got an upper level low that's going to give us some really good lift. We've got a lot of moisture in place. Moisture coming in from the Gulf of Mexico, 
moisture coming in from the Pacific. And when you put all these things together, it often spells heavy rain here across South Texas. And I think that's exactly what we'll be looking at on Saturday. This is 7 a.m. and by 7 p.m starting to or will continue to see some storms. So I think initially we'll have some storms that will move west east into our area Friday night into Saturday morning. And then during the day on Saturday, we'll see more rounds of storms, some of which that could train over the same areas. And if that happens, then we could pick up some big rainfall totals and the threat for flash flooding will definitely be there. So we got to be really careful on Saturday. I think the heaviest of the rain is going to fall in this corridor here. So we're talking San Antonio, Wichita Falls, down to maybe Laredo. In this zone is where you're going to see some big totals. And right now the estimations are anywhere from four to six inches with some isolated spots, maybe up to seven inches. Uh, we know what that can do around here with some of our creeks and rivers and streams and that sort of thing and low water crossings. And on top of all that, we've got to watch for some severe weather Friday night. As those storms come out of Mexico, and move west to east into the area, we could see some hail and gusty winds. So that's another thing to watch for Friday evening. Of course, we'll be here to let you know how this all plays out, but expect slight chances next couple days. Better chances Friday evening, our best chance Saturday and still some lingering showers and storms on Mother's Day. We'll be right back. Welcome back. 12.55 this Wednesday afternoon. We are counting down the days to Mother's Day. Yeah, did you get your gift yet for Mom? Uh, if she's watching from Philadelphia, I don't want to spoil it. Just, just write it I down. I like to, to I'll, leave I'll, her in anticipation. I'll, I'll let you know if it's a good gift. Okay, that's fair. All right. Rain, <laughs> how, always how a good gift, but also whatever you guys are making today on the show, <laughs> great gift. Well, yes, <laughs> indeed. And we're going to tell you, first of all, how to get a free breakfast. That'd yes. be a pretty neat gift. <laughs> Absolutely. And it is a wild Wednesday here. So we've got Amanda Winter from Once in a Wild here with some of her cute little animals. Who are these guys? These guys are two-year-old red-footed tortoises. Their names are Rocket and Jet. Aww. Aren't they adorable? They're so cute. And they live to be <laughs> ripe old age. They right? sure do, up to around 70 years. They get a lot bigger than this. <laughs> All right, well, the other day I had a chance to chat with David Foster and Catherine McPhee. They are coming to town tomorrow night at the Tobin Center, and you're going to hear from them. Great to chat with them. And Jen is out live if you're looking for a unique experience for mom. That's right, there are things you do every day, right? Push the stroller, get in the vehicle, but what do you do when somebody tries to attack you? We'll show you some techniques to keep you safe. Wow. That'll <laughs> work up an appetite. No kidding. <laughs> Alamo Biscuit Company is here, and look at this. Oh, heavens to Betsy is all I have to say. <laughs> they are debuting a new menu item. We're going to tell you all about that. All right. All that and more when SA Live continues in just a few minutes. 